In this video, we will explore the parts of the eye that record the image, the retina, optic nerve, and brain. Hello, my name is Craig Blackwell. I'm an ophthalmologist in Santa Cruz, California. In other videos, we have concentrated on disorders of the eye, like glaucoma and macular degeneration. This is the second of two videos in which we just explore how the eye works, because it is a very interesting subject on its own. In the first video, we explored the focusing parts of the eye, the cornea, iris, and lens. In this part, we will cover the parts that record the image, the retina, optic nerve, and brain. Remember, this is for your information, and if you have eye problems, it does not replace consultation with your ophthalmologist. Light is all around us, bouncing off objects in random directions. The eye gathers in those random light rays and focuses them in a sharp image on the retina. So the eye is usually likened to a camera, but really it's more like a video camera, constantly registering new images and transmitting that information in the form of nerve impulses to the brain. The brain receives the nerve impulses and assembles them into an image. And then, of course, the brain also has to make sense of what it sees. Let's start off by reviewing our orientation to the eyeball. In part one, we started from the cornea, the clear window that lets light into the eye. The iris is the colored part. In the middle of the iris is an opening called the pupil. That controls how much light gets into the back of the eye. Behind the iris is the lens, which focuses light like the lens of a camera. Lining the inside of the eye is the retina, which senses the light and turns that into nerve impulses which are carried along the optic nerve to the brain. Here is a diagram of the layers of the retina. It's a little confusing because light entering from the top has to pass through all the inner cell layers before it reaches the light sensing cells, the rods and cones. But that's the way it's organized. Immediately under the photoreceptors is a layer of pigment cells. This is very important because it supports the metabolism of the photoreceptors. Here is a microscope view of the retina. At the bottom of the retinal layers, you can actually see the very orderly arrangement of the rods and cones. Here is the same diagram with the cellular connections added. When a photon of light is absorbed by a photoreceptor, that triggers a nerve impulse. That impulse is transmitted through a series of intermediate cells to the brain. Technically, the nerve impulse goes through a middle bipolar cell then to the ganglion cell, which sends an axon along the surface of the retina to the optic nerve. Ganglion cells are particularly important, and we will return to them in a minute. Each type of photoreceptor is sensitive to different wavelengths of light, as shown in the diagram. Rod photoreceptors are very sensitive, requiring only a single photon to trigger a response. But they do not differentiate color. That is the job of the cones. Think of the rods as working in dim light, making a black and white image. Color sense comes from cones, which come in three varieties, registering either blue, green, or red. Your retina organizes all colors as combinations of these three basic colors. Then there are some special colors, white being the most obvious example. Why is this special? Because the only colors nature gives us are the ones seen in the rainbow. But we perceive other colors, like white, which exists only in human perception by the additive combination of red, blue, and green. A few words about color blindness. The name is a bit of an exaggeration. It is rare that anyone has no color sense. There are as many kinds as there are pigment colors. The most common kind is red-green. That means there is a mutation in the M or green sensing pigment shifting the wavelength it absorbs. The result is greens don't look as green, and reds look different than they do to those with normal color perception. Red-green deficiency affects about 1 in 20 males. Here's a typical test plate. A normal person sees the number 74, while a red-green deficient person sees 21. The red-green defect affects mainly males because the gene is carried on the X chromosome. Since men are XY, they have only one copy of the gene. If it is a mutant, 
then there's not a normal gene to overrule it. Women are XX, so having two copies of the gene, both have to be mutant for them to show the trait. But if she has one normal and one mutant gene, her vision is normal, but she is a carrier. If she has a son, he has a 50% chance of being affected. Now, back to the retina. Cones are mostly packed in the center of the retina. This is the fovea, which serves your finest vision. Rods cover the periphery. Only in the very center of the retina is there one photoreceptor to one ganglion cell, which accounts for the sharpest vision being there. As you get further from the center, multiple photoreceptors feed into a single ganglion cell, so vision gets less sharp the further you get from the fovea. Some numbers. In the retina, there are about 125 million photoreceptors, but there are only 1 million nerve fibers in the optic nerve, so there is a 125 to 1 reduction, that is data compression, by the retina. The range of diseases in the retina is surprisingly broad, enough so that it occupies an entire subspecialty in ophthalmology. One common example is macular degeneration, that is, age-related deterioration of the pigment cells that support the metabolism of the retina. The photo shows deposits of waste products which unfortunately accumulate in the center of the retina, the part you use for seeing detail. A great deal of research effort is being put into understanding and treating this, as it is one of the biggest unsolved problems in ophthalmology. The optic nerve is the telephone cable that carries information from the eye to the brain. Here's a picture of the optic nerve as it exits the eye. We call this part the optic disc. This is a microscope view of the optic disc from the side. The orange line represents a nerve fiber, or axon, coming from a ganglion cell in the retina, which we saw before. The axon makes a right turn to exit the eye, becoming part of a bundle of about a million nerve fibers. Since the optic disc is an area where there is no retina, this creates the blind spot in your vision. Of the many things that can damage the optic nerve, the most frequent is glaucoma. That is where pressure inside the eye gets high enough to compress and eventually strangle individual nerve fibers. As nerve fibers die, bits of vision are gradually lost. In this slide, on the left is a photo of an optic nerve head showing glaucoma damage. On the right is the visual field for that person. The dark areas are vision permanently lost to glaucoma. However, if caught early enough, this is usually controllable by reducing the pressure. After the nerve fibers exit the eye, they travel through the orbit and meet at the base of the brain in a structure called the chiasm. At this junction, half of the nerve fibers stay on one side, while the other half cross over to the other side. Following the colors in the diagram shows how nerve fibers divide into right and left halves of vision. Specifically, the right half of the brain serves the left half of vision and vice versa. Clinically, when there is vision loss, the part of vision that is affected tells us where to look. If just one eye is affected, then the problem is in the eye or the optic nerve in front of the chiasm. An example of this would be a retinal detachment, here shown taking away part of vision in the left eye. If part of vision is affected in both eyes, then the problem is behind the chiasm. In this example, showing loss of the right side of vision from both eyes, the cause would be a stroke on the left side of the brain. The part of the brain that processes vision is the occipital cortex, which is located in the very back of the brain. As a general concept, information arrives from the retina and is assembled by the brain in stages. First, it recognizes lines and edges, then movement, form, and color, and eventually a full image is created. So that is the general concept. To understand more of the story, follow on, but be prepared. Things are going to get a little more complicated. Now that we have arrived at the brain, I'm going to backtrack a bit and return to the retina to add a level of organization we did not cover the first time. You remember we said the retina had 125 million photoreceptors, but only a million nerve fibers leave the eye. 
That means the first steps of vision processing begin here. Functionally, the retina, retina is organized as something called receptive fields. As a general concept, a receptive field includes all the input to a particular cell you are studying. In the retina, a receptive field includes all the photoreceptors that feed into a single ganglion cell. The illustration shows the concept of overlapping fields, but the actual fields are much, much smaller. Here is a microscope view showing a receptive field. Multiple photoreceptors from a specific area feed into a single ganglion cell. The number of photoreceptors that make up a field is small in the fovea, where your most detailed vision is. Away from the fovea, the number of photoreceptors per field increases as visual detail decreases. The retinal receptive field is organized in a very specific structure with a center and a surround. This is an illustration of one kind called an on-center field. The stimulus is a small spot of light shined into the eye, here represented by the orange circles. For an on-center, shining a small spot of light in the center area increases ganglion cell output. When light just fills the center, it makes the maximum output. The surround area is inhibitory, and to the extent that light hits it, the ganglion cell output is reduced. If the whole field is covered, output goes to zero. There is also an off-center field with the opposite activation properties. In the fovea, where your most detailed vision is, the size of the smallest receptive field center is 10 microns, or 0.01 millimeters. We can connect that to visual acuity, you know the 2020 number. That is a measure of the smallest space between images that you can separate, like the space between the bars of the letter E, which is determined by the spacing of the receptors. As you get further from the fovea, the receptive field gets larger. In the periphery, it can be a degree or more in size. So the retina is organized in ganglion cell receptive fields, each with a center surround structure, and that is the output that is sent to the brain. In the visual cortex, the first level of processing is simply mapping of the input from the center surround fields. The second level of processing links center surround fields together in rows. This is the receptive field of a cell in the cortex. You can see that grouping center surround fields in this way can be used to recognize a line or an edge. And that is just what happens. Here's a diagram showing results of an early experiment in vision research. The left side shows how a line was projected on a screen in various orientations and movement directions. On the right are recordings made of electrical activity from a single cell in the visual cortex. The result shows that this particular cell responds only to an edge crossing its field in a specific orientation and direction. Imagine that there are stacks of these kind of cells, each responding to a line or edge of a different orientation and direction. David Hubel and Torsten Weasel were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1981 for their research in figuring out these specific mechanisms of vision. The illustration on the left shows how the brain starts to process an image by detecting lines and edges. Further processing steps add movement, color, form, and depth perception. Movement, form, and depth perception are processed near the parietal lobe. Detail and color are processed near the temporal lobe. Eventually, the completed image reaches conscious recognition, somewhere in the brain that has yet to be identified. And that completes our tour from the eye to the brain, from external object to internal image. Of our five senses, vision allows us to appreciate the beauty of our world with a richness unequaled by any other sense.